Welcome to another episode of the Influential Nonprofit. I am your host, Mary Ann Dirsch, and today we're going to talk with Dana Litwin. Am I saying that right? Please make sure I'm saying you last are. Name. Yeah, okay. Dana. Dana, the classic spelling, Litwin, the always hard to say and pronounce, but you did perfectly. <laughs> All right. Dana is a, um, we just say a globally recognized strategic advisor, keynote expert, thought leader in volunteerism. And I really have not had anybody talk about volunteerism. And so I found you and I was like, oh, you have to come talk about this because I realized this is such an amazing opportunity for nonprofits. And I guess we're going to get all into that. Now, before I start that, I always ask the first question, which is tell me something you're really proud of and you don't get to brag about a lot. Something I'm proud of that I don't get to brag about a lot is in addition to my volunteer engagement nonprofit consulting work, my original training is classical and jazz musician. So I play a number of instruments at a professional level and that hardly ever once in a while it crosses over into this life the the that my musician persona crosses over sometimes at conferences or something like that or going out with with colleagues or things like that and when we get together in the before time but yeah that's that's a pretty fun fact wow that's amazing so what do you play uh my main instruments are keyboards and trumpet and French horn, and I can play any brass instrument and uh, guitar, percussion, some of the woodwinds, uh, a little bit of flute and saxophone, but primarily any instrument made out of brass, uh, I can play at a session level. Wow. That, that that's yes brag about that you're like prince you can play all the all, the, all you can play all of the, the instruments on your album <laughs> all the instruments on the album just not not as good of a guitar player as prince and almost no one on the planet will ever be rest that's in true. power 100 percent. yes 100 percent. okay so let's just get into this tell me like what do most nonprofits like what aren't they doing well with their volunteer and community engagement? Uh, most nonprofits do not realize the foundational strategic value of the volunteer engagement, of the volunteer events and activities and programs that they're doing. So that ties into very often the director of volunteer services, if they are at a director level or much more common manager or even coordinator is not valued as the in-house expert that they are, especially if they have CVA after their name, like I do, which is a, a the only global certification in volunteer administration. And really, if I could just shout from the rooftops and I do this a lot in my career and my other articles and YouTube series and things is to communicate to the executive leadership and boards of any nonprofit or government agency that utilizes volunteers that this is your most valuable asset and the person running that program was very often a department of one. They have more headcount than probably any other department in your agency and that should be valued and, and recognized for what it brings to the the capacity to do the mission of that organization All right i uh two things that came through one is i find that the volunteer people aren't the only one not seen as the experts you know the absolutely i i you know like my background is nonprofit marketing and mm -hmm you know, so many times, like I know those marketing folks, they know the right thing to do. They know what they, you know, the best practice for what, what they're supposed to be doing, but there's something in the politics or something in there. That's like, they're not recognizing and following that wisdom. And I don't know, like, I'm not sure what the, I think there's different reasons for the block. I don't know what it is in every case. It's just a frustrating experience. And even fundraising folks, like you know, trusting the people that you bring on board that they actually know what they're doing. Um, what does CVA stand for real quick for everyone? CVA is Certified in Volunteer Administration. And gotcha. if people go to CVA CERT, C -E -R -T .org, they can get more information on, right. on how to get that global recognition. But I 100% agree with you, Marianne. I think in general, in nonprofit leadership, I mean, I've seen this in the corporate 
world to uh, a lot of my, my friends and family are high up in tech companies because I live in Silicon Valley, basically. So that makes uh, sense. But, yeah. but, but there's very often you hire talent and you bring in expertise and then you don't follow their advice. You ignore and, it. <laughs> and you ignore it. And then things happen that you don't want to happen for the organization or, huh. or things don't go the way leadership thought when like, well, I brought you on. It's like, it would help if you did what I said right. <laughs> and you listened to right. your in-house experts. I think that's a problem across different departments and nonprofit. It's certainly a, a problem. I've worked with a lot of government agencies as well, both municipal and like up through regional and, and state level over the years. And it's a very common cultural challenge that expertise in general is not recognized. I will say that there's so much crossover between marketing, development and fundraising and volunteers. Sometimes it's the same person. Sometimes that's a department of one wearing three or four or five it, different hats. Yes. Uh huh. And then that and then that phenomenon is worse of like, well, you wear so many hats and other duties is assigned in quotation marks <laughs> as we often get. And it's really important to understand the connection between the volunteer and community engagement overall, that's donors and advocates and yeah. voters and supporters and fans that retweet stuff for you and people that are going to share the marketing materials and really the best advertisement any agency has for their mission is a volunteer or donor that's having a conversation with other influential people out in the community and like that's your best free you know, advertising, you're not buying that advertising, but that person's having a, a good experience and is committed to your cause. So let's give them the, the messaging materials, the message points to be able to have that conversation effectively, no matter their role with the agency. Right. And, you know, what I, like when you were talking about that, the, the leadership, like it's, and I was thinking, cause it's really rooted in trust. Right. And so when there's a lack of trust that usually comes from like fear, like a scarcity mentality, like they're going to get it wrong. Or what if I look bad? You know, what if they, and, and you know, they want to control that. And that's what I work with a lot of people on is really um, like a, adopting a mindset of, where, of like trust and, re, and releasing the outcome. Like, because, you know, if you don't like, if you don't have trust, it's really hard to get anything done. <laughs> right. First of all, trusting it, yourself. Right. And then like, right. like trusting other people, but like, like I was just thinking about, okay, that's rooted in like, there's a mistrust, there's a hesitation to really allow somebody to take the lead. And typically we don't do that because we're afraid that may look bad on us. So we, and then it winds up looking bad for all other reasons, but anyway. Okay. So I want to go back to something you said, you said the head count. So they have the biggest head yes. count. What, what does that mean? So in, in HR terms and, in you know, HR and volunteer engagement are, they're really two sides of, of a personnel coin. They, they operate differently. They kind of operate with um, opposite goals. But the word headcount is a very HR jargon thing of the amount of people you have essentially direct reporting or in your department or, or on your team. And so, you know, one example is when I, I entered into at entry level as a volunteer coordinator with Project Open Hand in 2002, 20 something years ago in San Francisco, I was one of three people running the volunteer program and we had, you know, 3000 volunteers. So we each were in charge of about a thousand people at any given time, which is great that the organization has that many volunteers to distribute food to critically ill homebound people and give out give out groceries to folks who who need food support but that's really typical and if you look at even larger organizations getting you know into international or international like red cross someone uh, director of volunteer services in a region might have you know 10 or 20,000 volunteers technically reporting maybe through a couple of other coordinators, but reporting up to them. And when you compare that ratio to staff, you know, if there's 10 or 20 or 50 times the number of volunteers as there are paid employees, that's a significant capacity building chunk of your mission. Like that, those folks, even if they're all part-time, uh, are doing a significant amount of work and contributing a lot of, of talent to the success of the agency and so so often 
at an executive level or C-suite level, there's this idea that, well, volunteers are free or they're nice to have. And it's like, no, it, it, it requires resourcing, you know, paying an expert a, a good wage to right. share their expertise, listening to that expert's expertise on how things should be with the program and, and what their budget should be. But, you know, volunteers are donating their time and talent, but just like donors, like that's not free. You have to invest in marketing to get a return. You have to invest in fundraising. You have to invest time and resources and talent and have someone with real experience and skill doing those jobs. And the same thing applies to volunteer services where you know, in nonprofits in general, people are, are underpaid. And like you said, there's that scarcity mindset, which I think right. is is a false mindset. And that leads to kind of micromanaging or feeling founder syndrome, like maybe one person started the nonprofit and now they're the CEO 20 years later. They don't let anyone else do anything exactly. without their approval. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that comes out of all of that trust of uh, lack of trust for the experts in-house comes from that that scarcity mindset and kind of a micromanaging or, or a fear or need to control the outcome yeah. and that actually backfires all the time <laughs> right I, this is what i teach the the more you can release the outcome the more likely you're actually yeah. going to get what you want which seems crazy and completely counterintuitive to what we've been taught but you know the more that you can allow people to to step into their expertise and step into their genius and their gifts the more you're going to get back and the happier folks are going to be because they're going to feel valued, you know, and excited to contribute because they know their contribute contribution has value. Um, right. I want to kind of shift for a second because one of the things I hear a lot is, you know, volunteers make the best donors, you know, like how do volunteers, like what does their contribution to the organization look like? Not just of their time, but of their treasure too. Well, there's been a ton of research, um, I know F uh, Fidelity Trustees has done a lot of research. The Labor Board has done a lot of research in the last 10 and 20 years in the United States. And consistently, the data says that a volunteer is at least, at least 10 times more likely to also be a donor than anyone else out in the community that's that's a cold call or, or just a random mailing or a connection. And yet, most, I think you would hopefully agree, Marianne, most marketing or fundraising development resources are devoted to the people you don't know yet. And and that can be out of balance with trying to build it, relationships with known donors versus like, well, you put a lot more energy into cold calls and and spammy emails and, and spammy postal postcards. If you just kept with the relationship building, not just of the volunteers and recognized when they overlap as donors and what that percentage is for your organization, that's a that's a, a lever to pull that will really, really help the organization with donor engagement, community engagement, volunteer engagement, and just, again, make, getting those free advertisements, yes. those advertisements talking I, out in the community. I 100% agree. I almost jumped out of my chair when you were saying that because what <laughs> I see- You look so excited. I know, I was like, yeah. <laughs> Like, so what I see is people are like, okay, we're, we don't have a relationship with these people. Let's make a relationship, but they want to do it from the outside. Like if you think of concentric circles, they're yeah. going to the farthest out circle, let's bring them in instead of saying, okay, who do we know that's already inside these circles and how can we grow them and lead us to more people, which is exactly what you're saying. That's the most efficient and effective way of doing it. And then what happens is when they, we go out, like, like I hear like, oh, corporations, like, okay, well. It takes a while to court people into the organization, you know, but when you, what I call is a brand of attraction, which is like, you're building this garden, you're growing, growing, growing this garden to attract people to it. All you have to do is nurture the assets that you already have, because they will lead you to the assets that you don't have, right? Like, or that you want to get yeah. to. And then they kind of like meet in the middle. I'm not saying that, you know, top level or higher level marketing isn't important. I'm just saying like, not at the expense of the, you know, caring for and, and building relationships with those that you already have. And like, for me, that looks like a lot of like, like email, like people right. don't email regularly to the people they already have. Like, well, why are you bringing in new people? You, you're not connecting the, you know, to the people that you already have. So you're just yeah, bringing they're people in. They're right. losing interest. Right. Yeah. You're just bringing yeah. people in to the point to ignore them. Like not, and I'm not, I said that like a little yeah. abruptly, but you know what I'm saying? Like, to, you, oh yeah. So, and the it's more, but the more, the more that you care for the people that you have, the more they will lead you to the people. Mm -hmm. Right. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Okay. It, and, that relationship ahead. building is so important. 
And um, so I'm, what if like you're an organization that you're like, we don't really use volunteers and we don't really, I don't know what they could do for us. Um, yeah. And, and that's a, that's a common thing that I actually consult with is either a company trying to decide, like, do we switch from all completely paid staff and, and then get some volunteers. And usually what I find when I go into that situation as a consultant is they have volunteers. They're just not recognizing them as such. And most of the time the volunteers are on board. They're donating their time or they're, or they're co-fundraising if gotcha. it's a working board. Mm -hmm. Those are volunteers <laughs> and they need to be managed in a way, not just as board members, but, but uh, you know, tracked as what is their contribution, both in fundraising, if it's that kind of working board, or if it's an advisory council or a friends of organization. A lot of times, again, in government agencies, the, gov the government agency cannot raise funds, but they have an adjacent nonprofit that does that for them. Those are volunteers. <laughs> so helping recognize that, oh, if our mission is you know, uh, helping uh, reading skills for adults, but we've had paid staff doing that, and but we have a volunteer board. It's like, well, that that's usually pretty easy not to replace staff. That's never the point, and that's another mistake executives make is thinking, oh, I can just replace a couple of full-time paid positions with some volunteers. Like, hmm, that's a labor law violation at a federal level, but uh, also that that doesn't work. So it's really thinking about how can volunteers, again, it's about capacity building. How can they enhance the mission and enhance and support the work of the agency, whether the team is, is paid or unpaid? And I think that gets down to, again, just not recognizing what is a volunteer, what can they do for us? There's always something, there's always something else that maybe has been on the back shelf because no one's had time to do it, or they think that, oh, volunteers aren't high skilled. You can get a volunteer to write your database code for you. You can get a volunteer to, depending on the organization, do you know part-time marketing for, for 20 hours a month and, and right. isn't marketing. So people will, you know, it's not about volunteering is never an unskilled thing. Even if you think, oh, I'm repetitively packing groceries in the food bank. Well, that might be a neurosurgeon packing groceries. Right. And she could be a prime donor if she has, if someone has that conversation and builds that relationship. And then she knows a whole bunch of other people out in a new sector or the community that can also be volunteers, be advocates, be voters, be, be donors. So it's that real relationship building and recognizing that you probably are already utilizing volunteers. You just haven't recognized it yet. Yeah. Um, I, and I've seen this roll both ways and I, I want to, I want to just say this because like I've been on the board and, um, of this, of an organization and they have this finance person that like has been a volunteer for years and like really is basically like serves as the finance committee and a chief financial mm -hmm. officer too, and it works for them. But then I also see that people are like, Oh, we're going to, See, like for 16 years, I worked at this company called 501 Creative. We did branding. And, I mean, they still do. They do branding and marketing for nonprofits. <laughs> and and um, uh, and so, and the people would say, oh, well, can't you find somebody to build you that website for free? And and, and I'm always like, uh, you know, maybe you could, but it could may not be what you want. So I feel like when you enter into those relationships as, as a volunteer, like you're going to do our marketing for 20 hours a month, that's a commitment, right? Like that's like, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And just being like really upfront, not just like, oh, I'm getting it for free because I don't want to pay for it. I'm getting it because I have someone who has the skills and the devotion and the commitment to do this for us. You, you see what I'm saying? Because absolutely. Yeah. Mm hmm and and that and that's that's the reason and it circles back to how we started in this conversation is when you have an in-house expert when you have whatever their title volunteer coordinator manager volunteer services director of community engagement whatever their title is when you have someone devoted as a leader of the volunteers they have that expertise to to balance and they have that knowledge typically of of labor laws too of like well there are there's things like Code for America and TechSoup and uh, N10.org that if you ask nicely and you make a good case or Taproot's another example, they will find someone to build you that website. You still need to work with them in a professional way like a client would, but you can get that level of pro bono thing. But it's about what's your what's your motivation to do so? Is it 
we want to build good skilled volunteers and good relationships with the community or is it only saving money? And if you think that it's only doing it to save money, um, that's when you start to get into that slippery slope of why would somebody care? Like if you're generally relationship building and this is someone who is already a donor or on a board and they know someone who can you know, devote this or you build a team and you project manage that four different volunteers are, are right. working together to write the database. Right. And, and that's, and let me just say, that's not it takes free. resources. That's not free because yeah, you gotta resources. have somebody yeah. managing those people. Yep. And, yep. At, and at yep. 501, you know, the policy was we just didn't do anything pro bono because it wasn't fair to the clients who paid. And like, that's kind of yeah. like, I have a, I have a policy of financial integrity. Like everybody pays the same. I can be flexible with how you pay, but really every, cause it's not, not, you know, yeah. no one's going to argue with, you know, my financial integrity. And, um, mm-hmm. but when you're like, okay, let's just get it for free. That really devalues all the players in the thing. And I just love what you're saying about there's a strategic reason and you have the resources to manage the people and the, and you know, and, you know, you want to create ties into the community, that would be a great way for somebody to get involved and get to know your organization through this contribution of expertise. Um, right. All right. So I have a feeling like there are volunteer, you know, coordinators, managers, executives right now who are screaming, yes, <laughs> thank you. Like you're being, I hope you find <laughs> this conversation very validating and share it with all your friends. What can they do to advocate for themselves like because we're saying like you may not always be the trusted advisor you want to be so Mm -hmm. how can how can they advocate for themselves so whatever level of management the leader of volunteers is as an organization uh it's really you you have to devote a certain amount of your time to managing up and educating and having the metrics, the data, uh, anecdotal stories, you know, in a survey minded data person would say you need qualitative and quantitative mm-hmm. data and information to share. But it really takes um, a, a consistent devotion to educating and managing up and helping other levels of management, even again, even if you're sitting on leadership team as a director, it's it you constantly need to help people understand the value of the expertise that that, that leader volunteers running that department ha- is, and specifically the contribution that all of the volunteer activities are having to the mission and looking at it in that holistic way of also donors, also voters, also advocates, also fans on social media, also sharing our marketing, that it can be very out of sight, out of mind. So if people aren't hearing about volunteers, then they just, you know, an executive director might just turn up once a year at the volunteer party and everyone's like, I don't know who this person is. (laughs) Like, why are they, why are they giving a speech? Like I see them in the annual report brochure, but they've never had a conversation with me before Mm -hmm. that really everyone in the organization uh, to, to different degrees is kind of also a volunteer coordinator that it isn't ever just on one person or one department. Like they're the experts who are doing the main program design, strategic planning, day-to-day supervision, but it's really on every other paid employee to at least have a basic understanding of if, if someone, for example, I've worked for a lot of parks and rec organizations, if a maintenance guy is out in the field pulling weeds and a hiker comes up and says, huh, is there a way to volunteer to pull weeds with you? He can he can do the elevator pitch of like, yeah, actually, the fourth Saturday of the month and and here's my colleague's card and get in touch with them. So everyone and hopefully as a marketer, you agree with this. Everyone should have that elevator pitch. Everyone Mm -hmm. in the organization of how to how to support as a volunteer, as a donor or advocate or vote for this measure that helps helps our cause, whatever that is. Everyone should have that updated at least, you know, once a year in kind of a little bit of an in-service training uh, so that everyone's comfortable having that interaction with with the community. And that also helps the paid staff members understand, oh, this really is an important part of the work that we're doing as an organization. It's not just a nice to have separate siloed department that just gets stuck. Right, all of those nice, those nice people. Um... Oh, they're so sweet to come and donate (laughs) their time. It's like, yeah, that's like, that also might be the teacher of your kid. So yeah, okay, these are human. (laughs) <laughs> now, um, you know, I had this, I did this big event a couple of a weeks ago. This, I do this donor attraction forum every year 
And um, Amy Fazio was on, she helps organizations like create community. Like her thing is mm -hmm. like building grassroots movements. And one of the things she said, which like people come for the cause, but they stay for the community. And I feel like that's right. super true with volunteers because, you know, like I was on the board of the foster adoptive care coalition. They're my clients, like their volunteers have a very high identity. I get that's the only way I can describe it. This like, uh, like they have a very like strong tie to their role as volunteers and, and specifically in this, um, this resale shop they have, you know, uh -huh. um, and, um, and, and they like, you know, they, they work up to certain levels and, you know, it's, uh -huh. it's like, they're very committed. And then another organization here locally, like called food outreach that I've known for years and years and years, like their volunteers are also like very, like they highly self-identify as a food outreach volunteer. And right. so how do you create that? Because like they are bought in, you know what I mean? This mm -hmm. is part of their identity. Like, cause you were talking about like the volunteer party at the end of the year, like, um, how, how people really strongly identify. I, f I foster dogs for stray rescue. I have a foster puppy sleeping Yay. yeah, over here right now, <laughs> Tina, um, little Miss Tina, and she's being so good and so quiet today. And, um, like one time I was actually facilitating this whole thing and I had a foster puppy, like on my arm holding her <laughs> because like, she was, I want crying. to see the baby show yeah, me like, the puppy <laughs> like crying the whole time. So I had to hold her so I could actually have Aww. the zoom call of like 30 people on it. So anyway, but I volunteer for them for forever because I love the job. I've never held a leadership position. I don't want to, I just want to mm -hmm. get my puppies, take them home, love on them and get them adopted and then go get more puppies. Like that's just my thing. Yep. And I've been doing it for years and years and years. I have a high identity, like, like as a foster parent. So how, how do you, you know, create that in people? It's well, the core question is why do people volunteer? And the answer is because they want to. Something resonates with them in how you're marketing and communicating the mission, the clarity of the opportunities. You kind of need to, to set and meet expectations. Like this is what the agency does for volunteers or donors. This is what you do for us. It's very clear to everybody. But I developed a, a system some years ago to help organizations get to that point called the three C's of happy volunteers. And the three C's are comfort, convenience, and connection. And there's some subcategories like under convenience is time, transportation, and technology. Under comfort is trust and together. So that trust theme that we keep circling back to. But really when you have these ideas in mind, and I do 30 minute to six hour webinars or, or workshops on this, depending on, on how deep people want to dive into it. And I'm currently writing a book about it, which hopefully is out Yay! later this year. Yay, books, um, time for books. When does that happen? But, uh, but really, if you if you're always thinking about the comfort, the convenience and the connection of anyone that you want to engage in the community, but especially volunteers who are, are directly giving their time and talent, then when people know that you're thinking about that, that is part of building that trust, that you're in this together, that it's not that it's not just a transactional, I only turn up and I do this thing and we don't really talk and, and then I, I click out. Some people want that level of interaction, that's fine, but you're really looking for that relationship building and, and whether it's for five minutes, like a micro volunteering opportunity there's an app called be my eyes where someone who's sighted can read a label on a can in a store for a blind person who's using the app and so there's a lot of ways it doesn't really matter what amount of time you're kind of having these micro relationships and all these interactions uh, that potentially i say every interaction is an invitation to stay or an invitation to go and that's true of donors and that's Ooh. true of volunteers Ooh, that's every true of interaction wait Getting chills? What? I thought you had chills. Oh, that was so good. <laughs> Every you... interaction, an invitation to stay or an or invitation no. to go. Uh, that's so true of all that. of us all yeah. the time, yeah. right? Like, right. Um, is this right? And uh, it doesn't. And you happen. can invite. You can invite people to go if someone's not a right fit or they're right. Exactly. Like I would say sometimes like, it is an invitation to yeah, go. Like, see you later. Like yeah. it, that's another misconception that you can't fire volunteers. Like I've probably fired more volunteers than, you know, I've hired paid staff <laughs> over the years. And it's usually, um, but if you have, if you stick to the three C's, if you're always thinking about 
everyone's comfort, convenience, and connection, that c can create a sense of belonging and welcoming and equity and access that really does o open up the doors to all sorts of different kinds of community engagement. Even if you're starting or intending or focusing on volunteers or you're focusing on donors, really look at the whole picture of, of how many ways can that person interact with the agency and support the agency instead right. of only worrying about a volunteer or a donor and thinking that that's going to be two different people when it's very often the same person. So one of like, um, my coach, she always says, cause you know, it's a cult, it's a culture, not a cult. People get to go, right? you know, like, and so, right. and separation is like, I do feel like that. Like, how can I ask them? Like, wait, separation is, is going to happen. I mean, and that's like, you have to release what's no longer serving you to make room for what does. So if you're, you know, right. and that, and, and, and sometimes it's hard to do that. It's hard to release people. And like, when I'm hearing you creating these, and in, in your three C's, like it's so much, e it would be so much easier to have these conversations because you have the connection, like, like you can be open right. about like, Hey, I just don't have the time for this anymore, or, you know, or whatever, like, cause people, you know, go through cycles of their life, you know, like I've gone like where I didn't foster for a couple of years. Like I had my, you know, we moved and my dad died and, you know, and then like, doesn't you know, work gonna... for you at that point. Yeah. Right. And that's totally okay. And then I'll pick it back up. You know, um, we remodeled last year. We didn't have, we just couldn't have puppies in the house. Our house was like a mess and, um, you know, just, just wasn't the right time. And, but like having, being able to have those conversations with people, like, I, I also feel like in board members and stuff, because they're volunteers, we have to just accept whatever they give because instead of like having standards, because it's free, because we feel like we have no leverage. Mm -hmm. And I guess there's plenty of leverage. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and you just hit on Marianne, you hit on like, again, that number one misconception that volunteers are free and, or that for some reason that's connected to, we can't ever fire them or we have to treat them a different way. And I get that board members often are, you know, they're in, in charge of hiring or firing the executive director or other C-suite levels, depending on how an agency is organized. But that's why, again, keep coming back to you need that in-house expertise and you need to really listen, listen to them and respect their experience and knowledge that if there's, there's very often a board liaison, but that person isn't necessarily trained uh, or experienced as a leader of volunteers because it's its own, it's its own career. It's its own set of skills. It's its own thing. And it, again, lots of overlap with development and marketing and, you know, HR, lots of other hats that someone can wear in that role. But it really comes down to if you're not handling a team with expert management or expert coordination, then something's going to go off the rails. And handling personnel includes the life cycle of your work together is at an end. And that can be an amicable end, or it could be that one or the other of you has hurt feelings and, and that has to be dealt with. But I have, a, I have another webinar called uh, Hold Em or Fold Em, How to Hire, Inspire, or Fire vol uh, <laughs> Volunteers. Ooh. And, and, you know, it gets into certain patterns of behavior or personality types and kind of how to manage someone who's, you know, being challenging or disruptive or, or causing conflict. And, you know, one of the main slides is like, yeah, just fire. If they cross a line and there's a clear code of conduct and they've been trained to this or there's a, a volunteer or employee handbook that, should have the same code of conduct in it that someone's violated that's that's out the door whether they're a donor or, or someone else because in the long run that creates problems and pr problems and liability for the rest of the organization depending on the bad yeah. behavior that, that's happening with that person but it's like totally valid to understand meet people where they are especially the last two years of the pandemic where it's like well we've had a a, a cultural trauma of a mass death and disabling event. So what someone could commit to three years ago versus two years ago versus one year ago to today is going to look very, very different. And so having that grace and compassion to meet people where they are, understand when people need to either completely step away or just go on a leave of absence and hit the pause button and having a robust and kind of healthy enough volunteer engagement or community engagement strategic plan and, and set of programs that that doesn't jeopardize the mission. If you don't, if you lose one volunteer or one 
paid employee, that shouldn't shut down the whole agency. And very often that's the case. Someone's got a lot of institutional knowledge and they haven't trained trainers to pass this knowledge on. There isn't a sustainability or a legacy plan. And that's, that's probably a whole other podcast to dig into that. Yeah, for for sure. All right. This has been amazing. Um, I have, we will have um, your website and your social media in the, in the show notes and your YouTube to Dana's priceless advice for leaders of volunteers. Cause I just feel like we're just scratching the surface of what you know. Oh, no. this so is there's amazing. so much to talk about. Again, we could have like a whole weekend workshop and just laugh and, and I know we could, stuff. I would love it. But, yeah. Okay. And, um, I, have one more question. So this is how I sure. close on every podcast. So you are a musician. I am a fake musician cause I sing karaoke <laughs> and I yeah, love I it. Care. I, I, I love I, it. I, and so if you're in, you know, you're in Malibu right now, but you're typically in Silicon Valley, I'm in St. Louis, but if we ever found ourselves at a karaoke bar, what would be your go-to song? My go-to songs are, I do a great vocal Stevie Nicks impression. So anything nice. that's like, ah, Stevie Nicks, yes. I can, I, I am a little bit famous, infamous, something uh, at points of light and other large national volunteering conferences for either the karaoke party after the first day of conference where everyone goes out. But yeah, I will happily do some, some stand back, some stop dragging my heart around. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Leather and, and Dolly Parton is fun too. Okay. Yeah, leather, leather and Lace. lace. Yeah. I love that one. Yep. Yeah. Oh Good yeah. Excellent duet. So yeah, if I'm in, if I'm in St. Louis or, or you're, if you're out in California at either end of California, uh, I've got some great karaoke spots that, uh, I can take you to out here and we'll do some duets. I do too. I, the dive, you're the better around here, just so you yes. know. <laughs> yep. Yep. Everything yep. like I go to this bar, everything's a little <laughs> bit broken and I feel completely at home. And I, <laughs> it's my and favorite place. totally comfortable. Yeah. yeah totally. Comfortable <laughs> like, to, like, everything's just a little bit <laughs> like the chairs have tape on them, you know, the mic is dented. It's yeah. been dropped a million times by drunk people. Yeah. yeah. I love it. <laughs> yeah. That's my favorite thing. All right, Dana, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. And, um, and again, if you know, all her contact info will be in the show notes, so you can grab that, including her YouTube channel web series, Dana's Priceless Advice for Leaders of Volunteers. And um, if you want to tap into a little more of my knowledge, you can go to uh, theinfluentialnonprofit.com and you can download my um, Up Level Your Influence Starter Kit, which it's it, a lot of the things that I talk about here, you know, about trust and releasing the outcome and all that are in, um, are included in this guide. So if you want to go a little bit deeper into what I know, you can do that there and we'll see you next time on the influential nonprofit.